All right, guys, so we're going to um, do 4.3, and we're just going to do 4.3 um, while I'm gone. So I kind of looked at the sections and realized it would be asking quite a bit to do 4.3 and 4.5 um, while I'm gone. So we're just going to do 4.3. And 4.3, this might, I might break this up into two lectures, and we'll see if we can just push through. But we're going to do what we call the first and second derivative tests. And, and just like the title of this section says what derivatives tell us, that's kind of the idea of this whole section. So this whole section is going to be talking about how the first and second derivative can give us some um, information about the graph of a function. And it's all about the graph of a function. So for example, like if I had some function, and I'm just going to put this function in... Um, in the first quadrant. It doesn't have to be in the first quadrant, but let's just look at a, kind of a chunk of this function maybe um, in the first quadrant. And let's say that this function does something like this. Oh, that's really shaky. I don't know why. Let me, let me try and make that a little bit more smooth. Okay, so this is my function f of x, and I want to point out a couple of interesting things about this function. And um, let's just kind of talk about what happened to my function values as we're going along this function starting at a going through right infinity so let's say our domain is a to infinity so let's talk about kind of what's happening with this function so as i start out on a what is happening to my my function values right so that's my y values what is happening to my y values as i'm going from a until about this point right here right what do you notice we'll just call this b i don't know we're getting, we're getting a little crazy here I'll call that little b. So in between this interval right here, if you notice, my function's increasing, right? The values of my function are getting, the y values are getting bigger. So in this case, we are increasing over this part of my function. Then what happens? We start decreasing, right? My values get smaller and smaller until about this point right here. Here we're decreasing. Then we start increasing again until about here, right? And then we stay constant from here on out. So I'm not actually going to, you can look in your book. Um, if you look in your book on page, what page is it? 257. You are welcome to copy down that little definition that talks about what it means for a function to be increasing and decreasing. And basically what it means for a function to be increasing or decreasing is, if it's increasing, my function values are getting bigger. <laughs> That's basically what it says. Um, it says it more mathematically, right? Like f of x. 2 is bigger than f of x1, but you can look at that. So um, my function values are getting bigger. If I'm increasing my function values, my y values, remember, are getting smaller. And this is as we're looking left to right, as we go left to right. And then for constant, what does that mean for it to be constant is that my function values are the same. So what we care about, right, because we're in calculus one, is we care about derivatives. So let's kind of see if we can get an idea of what is happening with our derivative when we have a function like this, and that's what I really care about. So you're welcome to write down that definition on page 257. But what I care more about is, can the derivative help us determine if my function is increasing or decreasing over an interval? And it turns out you can. So let's look at, if I drew some tangent lines, right? What do you notice about all of these, tan these are beautiful tangent lines, all of these yellow tangent lines right here. Well, they have positive slope. Do you see how they're all sloped up? This is a positive slope, right? We have a positive change in y for a positive change in x as we look left to right. So what do I know in this interval right here? I know in this interval right here, f primed, right, is greater than zero. It's positive. Another way to say something is positive is to say it's greater than zero. Hope that makes sense. So if you notice, right, all the slopes of these lines are positive. What do you notice right at this point right here? We well, you know this. This shows us that f prime is equal to zero. I have a horizontal tangent. And then as we've talked about often in class, this, this function actually does change direction. So I look at my, the slope of my lines here. I'm going to come over on this side now that I've kind of switched right there. The slope of my lines now in this case, right, <clears throat> let me get rid of that guy really quick and put them up here. Here we're decreasing. So notice the slope of my lines once I've hit that zero and come down. These are all negative slopes, right? They're basically pointing down. That's what it means for slope to be negative. Remember the derivative gives us the slope of the tangent lines. So what do I know about this interval right here? I know that my slopes must be negative, so that means my derivative must be zero. Nope, my derivative must be negative. 
<laughs> Sorry, I was trying to think about what I was going to say next. So you shouldn't do that. Um, what happens right here? What happens at C? Right, right here. We know we've talked about this before. F primed um, of x is equal to zero, or f primed is equal to zero. And then what do you notice happened to my tangent lines here? They kind of go over here at this point. Again, positive slope. So what do I know? F primed is greater than zero here. And then what happens here? Here, it depends on how this guy looks. This this point right here, f primed is zero or undefined possibly. But what happens, this is constant, right? And if it's constant, f primed is equal to zero over that whole interval. Because if I draw tangent lines, right, they're all horizontal. So guys, this is the gist of what we care about today. How can the derivative tell us things? So if I am given a function and I take its derivative, right, could I tell where my function is over what intervals my function is increasing? Could I tell over what intervals my function is decreasing? I sure can, because as long as I know that my function is positive, I know I'm increasing on that interval. If I know, sorry, derivative. If my derivative is negative, that tells me my function values are decreasing on that interval. And then of course, if my function is zero, which we've seen before, that's a critical point. And I have the possibility not necessarily I always have it, but I have the possibility, right, of it being a local max or a local min. Or in this case, right here, I have an absolute max. So let's kind of write that down. Um, uh, this is a theorem. And I just, we've already kind of talked about it, but I just want to write this down to make sure we have it. So let f, let <laughs> f be continuous and differentiable. Whoops, let's let it let's let it be continuous. Sorry, I'm gonna just say this a little bit differently. Continuous on I um some open interval I. Oh my goodness. Some open interval I. I don't even need it to be um open. I just need an interval. Sorry guys. Some interval I. Not enough copy today. That is what I know. Let f be continuous on some interval i and differentiable at every interior point at i or of i. So I don't have to be differentiable necessarily at the endpoints, right? Then here's some stuff we know. Okay, so some stuff we know, part one, if the derivative is positive on i, f is increasing on i. Okay, so if I have a positive derivative, that just tells me I'm increasing, which makes sense, you guys. A positive derivative tells me I have a positive slope. We also know the derivative gives us a rate of change, right? So if I have a positive rate of change, that means that I'm increasing. Think about your speed. Um, or your, let's talk about speed, um, or even your velocity. We know we're increasing if we have a positive derivative. <clears throat> If the derivative is negative, another way to say negative is less than zero on some interval i, then f is decreasing on i. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a function and then we're going to use the derivative to determine those intervals without actually having to sketch the function. We're first going to just look at the look at the derivative itself of a graph. We can always graph it. We can graph it on Desmos or our graphing calculator and make sure that the algebra and the calculus we do really match up with what the graph is doing. Okay, but this is this is what we know. If I can find the intervals over which we're de we're, our derivative is positive and over which it is negative, then I know that I can find um, those intervals of increasing and decreasing. Sorry, just all right. So let's do some examples. So what I want us to do is find the intervals over which and we'll do a couple of these over which f of x is increasing and decreasing. And let's start off kind of simple with a polynomial. Okay, so my first example here, let me get it out. All right, so we're gonna start off with a fairly easy one. Let's look at f of x equals negative two x squared plus eight x plus one. 
So the important part in this section is how you show your work. So I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm a bit particular about how you show things. So I'm going to show you a really nice way to build a table kind of and, and figure out where your derivative is positive and negative. And then I think it's easy to see where you're increasing and decreasing. So first off, if I want to know where it's increasing and decreasing, I need to know where the derivative is positive or negative. So the first thing you should do, right, that's your always, always your answer in Calc 1, is take it derivative. Now, if I want to know where this guy is positive and negative, think about, and we've talked about this again before, if I'm going to, if my derivative is going to change from being either positive to negative or negative to positive, think about what number you must go through, right? We must go through the number zero. If you're on the real number line, right, the definition of a positive number is it's to the right of zero. The definition of a negative number is it's to the left of zero. If you're on the right of zero and you want to travel to the left of zero to visit a friend, what must you go through, people? You got to go through zero. Same thing with the negative and positive, going net from negative to positive. So the point here is, if I want to figure out where the derivative is positive and where the derivative is negative, I first need to know where the derivative is zero. So the interesting thing about this is we also know that's where our critical points are, right? So we're going to expand this idea to actually finding like local min and local max. But if I set this equal to zero, this implies then that x is two. So what I'm going to do is create a little table and I encourage you to do this. So I'm basically making a little number line, okay? I'm, I'm going to test the derivative. So my derivative is a negative 4x plus 8. Remember, if my derivative is positive over an interval, then I know that I'm increasing. If it's negative over an interval, I know I'm decreasing. So I know my derivative is 0 here at 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick some points to the left of 2. Pick any point to the left of 2. Just has to be smaller than 2. I use 0 if I can because it's easy. So I'm going to plug 0 into this. If, oh, if I take f primed of 0, right, and you don't even have to show me what this number is, but it's 8, right? <laughs> so what do I know? That this that the derivative is positive to the left of 2. How do I know it doesn't go negative anywhere? Because, you guys, to go negative, what number would it have to go through? It would have to go through 0, and I know the only place my derivative is 0 is at 2. Cool. I'm going to take a test point to the right of 2. Let's take, I don't know, 3. So the derivative at 3, f primed of 3, is a negative 12 plus 8, which is a negative 4. So what do I know about the derivative to the right of 2? It is negative. So what do I know about the function then when it's positive? I know it's increasing. And then what do I know about the function when it's when the derivative is negative? I know it's decreasing. Remember, increasing and decreasing doesn't care anything about what the actual function values are. We just care, are they getting bigger or are they getting smaller? And what I know about this function is that we're, my function values are getting bigger until I get to x equals 2, and then they are smaller. Also, if you kind of look at these these um, arrows right here, what we're going to see is because this shows at a critical point that I increase and then I decrease, it shows that I actually have a local maximum there. And we're going to see actually it's an absolute maximum. But so what do I, how do I state my answer then? Well, what is the interval over which f is increasing? Right? Well, the domain of this function, right, this is a parabola, so it's minus infinity to infinity. So this whole side right here is going to be minus infinity to 2. You do not include 2. At 2, right, my derivative is 0, so I'm neither increasing nor decreasing at 2. So when you list these intervals of increasing and decreasing, you will never put square brackets around these numbers because these numbers are going to represent where the derivative is 0. So my function is increasing from minus infinity to 2 and decreasing from 2 to infinity. Let's really quick look at a graph of this function, and I, and I want to show you kind of um, why this is true. So y equals negative 2x um, squared. What was it? Plus 8x? Um, and then what was the other one? Um, plus 1. Okay, so look at this graph. Sure enough, if you notice at x equals 2, right, what happens? My function is increasing, increasing, increasing. At 2, it changes direction and it starts decreasing. So it's increasing from minus infinity to 2 and then decreasing from 2 to infinity. hope that makes sense. Yeah? Yeah, I'm sure it does. Also, we're going to see, this is going to be easy to take this idea and just go ahead and expand it to 
finding maximums and minimums, but we're not quite there yet. Let's do another example with the increasing and decreasing. Okay, so let's look at this example. What if I had f of x equals um, 6x to the 4 thirds plus 3x to the 1 third? Okay, so the derivative of this, f prime of x, right? I want to find where this is zero, or guys, I also need to consider where this function might be undefined. Because if you think about it, right, what if I had a graph that um, did something like this? Well, that's a little bit strange, but um, here I'm increasing, decreasing, increasing, right? And then actually I decrease a little bit and then I increase. So not only where the derivative is zero, right, but I could have a cusp or a corner that also causes a change in direction or a change in increasing or decreasing. So I'm going to go ahead and take this derivative. So I have plus one third of three is one. This is a negative two thirds. Three goes into six two times. So let's look at what I have here. I have eight x to the one third, right, plus one over x to the two thirds. So I want to get a common denominator because I want to make sure I consider all the places where this function is not only zero but also undefined. So I'm going to get a common denominator. Remember this is 8x to the one third over 1. So I'm going to multiply this by x to the two thirds over x to the two thirds. This actually works out pretty wonderfully. That's why we probably picked it. So f primed of x, what do I get here? x to the two thirds times x to the one third. I add exponents when I multiply like, like bases. So two thirds plus one third is one. And then this is all over x to the two thirds, okay? So what I wanna figure out is I wanna find my critical points because I wanna be able to see um, where I'm increasing and decreasing, right? So let's go ahead and find where um, I have my critical points. So my critical points are going to occur when the numerator is zero, that's gonna set the actual derivative equal to zero, right? So x equals a negative one eighth, or where my denominator is zero, because what if I have a cusp? I could switch from increasing to decreasing at a cusp. So I'm gonna look at x equals zero as well. Okay, so let's let's look at what's happening here. So again, I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna put, you need to put these in order because remember this is kind of like a little, well not kind of, it is a little number line that you're putting in. Let's put in zero. What I sometimes like to do so I don't have to do the whole fraction at once. What I like to do sometimes with my derivative is I say, okay, when I pick a number, what does that do to the numerator? When I pick another number, what does that do to the denominator? Or I'll do this with multiple factors of my derivative. Um, and then finally, what does that do to the derivative? So, so stay with me on this, it'll be all right. Let's pick a number less than negative one eighth. So how about negative one? So if I take eight times negative one and I add one to it, right? Eight times negative one is negative eight, plus one is a negative seven. So the numerator will be negative. If I put negative 1 into here, notice what does this 2 do? It squares it. So you're going to square negative 1. That'll be positive. And then cube root it, which is going to stay positive. And then what is a negative divided by a positive? It's negative. So do you see how the, I know that looks like a lot more work, but it actually goes a little faster. So what do I know about my function here? We're decreasing. Let's take a number between uh, negative 1 8 and um, 0. How about a negative 1 16th? So if I put in a negative 1 16th, 8 times a negative 1 16th plus 1, that'd be a negative 1 half plus 1, so that's going to be positive. This guy, you know guys, is always going to be positive because of that 2 right there. That's always going to square it, so that's going to be positive. So I know I'm here. And then at this 0, actually if I put in 1, this stays positive, this stays positive, so we are positive here. So this is kind of an interesting graph. I'm excited to see what it looks like on Desmos. So what do I know? I know that I'm decreasing, right? And if you just want to abbreviate that with like a capital D or a capital I, that's fine. I'm going to be decreasing from minus infinity to what? Negative one eighth. And then I'm going to be increasing, right? I got to be a little careful when I state this. I'm increasing from negative one eighth to zero and from zero to infinity. Technically, I'm not increasing right at zero because I know my derivative is zero there. And remember, I only am increasing if my derivative is positive. Zero is neither positive nor negative. I'm only decreasing when my derivative is negative. Ooh, let's look at the graph of this. I'm super excited. 
to see what the graph of this looks like. I'm just using Desmos here. So I'm going to do 6x to the 4 thirds. And remember, I'm graphing the original function. Okay, and then plus 3x to the 1 third. Oh, wow, this one's really, really cool. So look at what we have here. If you notice, them, so if you look at that zero there, we actually, um, so I was mistaken when I said the derivative was zero, right? The derivative wasn't zero at zero. What we get there is a vertical tangent. So my function, we could probably say that my function is increasing the whole way from minus one, negative one eighth all the way to infinity, that would be fine. If you also broke it up at zero, I would be fine with that as well. But because you gotta be a little bit careful because technically at zero, you know, maybe I'm, kind of infinite, but if you look at the y values, are my y values continually getting bigger from minus, from a negative one eighth to infinity? They are. So again, notice I have, um, I'm decreasing right until this point right here. This point right here is a negative one eighth. That's a negative 0.125. And then I'm increasing from there on out. All right. So with these last two examples we did, one thing that we're not kind of talking about that is really useful and interesting for us, right, is that what does this imply we have right here? And we saw that back here. I have a minimum right here, not only a local minimum, but it's actually an absolute minimum. And this is what we call the first derivative test. So what the first derivative test tells us, we're actually doing the first derivative test. I didn't actually, I just didn't tell you that. Um, the first derivative test allows us to see the intervals where we're increasing and decreasing, right? But what it also allows us to see is where I have a maximum or a minimum. Because here, if you kind of, you know, sketch what the graph might look like, do you see I would be decreasing, I have a horizontal tangent of zero, and then I'm increasing. Here with the zero, I had ended up having a vertical tangent, so that's a little bit beside the point. But, but what the first derivative test can tell us is how my function can actually change at a local maximum or a local minimum. So what I would like to do is just kind of state the first derivative test. And we'll do what I want because you're not here. <laughs> state the first derivative test and then we'll just do a bunch of examples with it. Okay. So the first derivative test, um, this is just a theorem. And this is the first. So we're going to have a second derivative test also. So make sure you really understand um, if we're talking the directions, we'll say not understand. Make sure you really read the directions. The directions will tell you to either use the first derivative test or the second derivative test. Okay. So let's let f be continuous on an interval containing C, oh, containing, sorry, containing a critical point. Ah, this is the important part, a critical point. We rem remember what a critical point is, right? So um, containing a critical point C, okay? Um, and a, so a critical point C, remember that means that either F primed of C then is either zero or f primed of c is undefined. Also, let x or let f be differentiable on this interval, except maybe at c, right? <laughs> because we said that that's a critical point, so we could be undefined there. I could have. Um, could have a cusp or a corner there, right? So let f be differentiable on this interval except possibly at c. All right, so here's what the first um, derivative is going to tell us. It's going to help us figure out uh, where we have maximums and minimums, okay? So the first part of this, of this first derivative test tells us that if f primed of x, or just f primed, changes, not of x, it can be of x, from positive to negative. If the derivative changes from positive to negative at c, then what do we know? Then f has a local max at c. 
I'm going to run out of room. Okay, so think about this. Changes from positive to negative, right? And I always kind of sketch this. If I go from positive to negative, then I know I'm increasing. That's the definition of increasing and decreasing with respect to the derivative. And then I know I'm decreasing. Do you see how that's going to give me a maximum? Sometimes I sketch it. And you, you saw that when I was doing the examples. Um, likewise, if f changes, smaller here, from, I'm going to be a little bit lazy here, negative to positive at C, I hope that's okay. Then what does F have? Well, let's think about this, right? If F changes from negative, meaning I'm decreasing, to positive, meaning I'm increasing, then notice what do you have there? You're going to have a minimum. Then F has a local minimum at C. Okay. And then the last thing, um, if f primed does not change at c, does not change sign at c, then no local extrema exist at c. Okay. That's the first derivative test, guys. So the important part about the first derivative test is if we can show that f prime changes from positive to negative, then we have a max, okay? If we can show that f change, f primed, oh, Sarah, not f, f primed, okay? If, if we can show that f prime changes from negative to positive at c, then we have a local min. Okay, if f prime doesn't change at c, then we have no local extrema at that point. Let's do some examples. These are really, really fun to do. The ones we've just done actually show us that, let's look back at this one right here. So look at, we have a critical point, right? Negative 1 eighth was a critical point because it's where my derivative was equal to zero. Zero is a critical point also, that's where my derivative is undefined. But based on this, what do I know? I go from decreasing to increasing at negative 1 eighth. So we know from this one right here, there is a local min at negative one eighth. Now we have to figure out, we'd have to plug that into the function, right, to figure out what that minimum is. Is there any extrema at zero? No extrema at zero. And we saw that also because I don't change direction. In order to get a max or a min, I have to change direction. Okay, so let's do some examples because these are super, super, super fun to do. I totally understand that your idea of fun and my idea of fun are exactly the same. <laughs> So quick example, um, use the first derivative test. To find all local extrema of the given function. So when I say local extrema, I mean local max and mince. All right, let's have some fun. I know you're like, but Sarah, I'm having so much fun already. How could I possibly have more fun? Oh, <laughs> you just wait. All right, f of x equals 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed. Okay, minus 36x squared plus 4. And now I could, so on your homework, what you're going to see is they're going um, I don't love how they stated this, but what they do is they have you find local max and mins, and then they give you a closed interval. So remember in the last section we saw with the extreme value theorem that if I have a function over a closed interval, then I'm guaranteed that has an absolute max and min. So what you want to do with those is if, if it gives you an interval, ignore, ignore the interval, you know, whatever they give you here, and just do what I'm doing here. Find all the local max and mins, and then in the very end, you plug in the values in the interval and determine if it has an absolute max or min over that interval, okay? But this is more likely the type of test question I'm going to give you. Use the first derivative test to find all local extrema of this given function. Okay, so what we need to do, step one. So let's kind of write down our steps for using the first derivative test. Find, step one, find all critical points. That is where we could possibly have a max or a min, right? So find all critical points of f of x. So how do we find critical points? We set the derivative equal to zero. So 
answer in Calc 1 is always derivative. So let's take the derivative, not always, but 12x squared minus 72x. And I'm going to set that sucker equal to zero. We're going to need two screens for this. This is going to be a good one. All right, so what can I do here? Let's take out a 12x. I'd be left with x squared minus x minus 6, I think, is equal to zero. Factor, I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes the hardest part about these problems is the algebra equals zero. So what are my critical points? Where could I possibly have a local max or a min at zero, three, and negative two? Okay, so that's going to be the first step. I want to find all critical points of my function. I'm just getting a new layer here. Let me clear that out. Okay, step two. So find all critical points, right? Test around critical points. Okay. To find the sign, I'll just put the signs of f prime of x in all of these different intervals. All right. So what are my critical points? 0, 3, and negative 2. So I'm going to test 0, 3, negative 2. You need to put those in order because remember this is a number line. So this is going to be negative 2. This is going to be 0. And this is going to be 3. Okay, so I'm going to test around these points. I'm going to give myself a little bit more room because I have a bunch of different factors for f prime of x, right? I had 12x was one of my factors. I had um, x minus 3 was a factor and x plus 2 was a factor. And then when I put those all together, what sign does that give me for f prime of x? Again, this is the way that I do it because I think it's just, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. Um, it just, it actually goes faster. I know it looks like it's a little bit more work to put down like all of those um, factors, but I think you'll see it's easier than trying to put it into, you know, 12x cubed minus 12x squared minus 72x. So I'll show you what I mean. All right, give me a number less than negative two. You guys are answering me with negative three. So 12 times negative three, that's going to be negative. Negative three minus three is negative. Guys, I don't care what the actual value is. All I care is if it's positive or negative. That's it. Negative three plus two is also negative. If I take three negatives and multiply them together, what do I get? I get a negative number. Negative times a negative is positive, times another negative is negative. All right, give me a number between zero and negative two. Obviously negative one, but you're welcome to use like a negative nine eighths if you would like to. If I put in negative one, 12 times negative one is negative. Negative one minus three is negative. Negative one plus two is positive. So I have a negative times a negative times a positive. So I'm positive here. So what does that tell me about f prime of x? I, I like to do this. I'm negative here, so I'm decreasing. Positive here, so I'm increasing. This helps me kind of see what the graph would look like. Number between zero and three, let's just pick one. 12 times one, positive. One minus three is negative. One plus two is positive. And what do we get here then? We get a negative. So go ahead and that's decreasing. And then finally, give me a number bigger than three, like four. Um, that would be positive. Four minus three is positive. And then four plus two is positive. Everyone is so positive to the right of three. So nice. So this is the first derivative test, you guys. You can see um, pretty clearly, I think, um, that this is going to be a min. This is going to be a max, right? And this is going to be a min. Do you see how this has gone down, up, down, and then up. So my third step then is use, um, uh, what do I want to, how do I want to say this? I'm kind of going off the cuff here. Um, use the chart. I'll just say the chart to determine max and mints. I'll just say determine extrema. All right, and so what do I know here? Let's figure out what our maximums are. I'm gonna grab a calculator. So what do I know? I know that I have a min at negative two. People, my minimum isn't negative two. I have a min at negative two. So if I look at my original function, let's write that down. What was my original function? My original function was 
um, 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed minus 36x squared plus 4. So what do I know I have? I know I have a local min of, right, I would have 3 times 16 minus 4 times negative 8 minus 36 times 4. I'm just doing this all here in my head, not in my head, <laughs> of negative 60. And where does it occur? At x equals negative 2. I have a local max. I can see from my chart, right? I increase and then decrease. If I put in 0 into my function, I get 4. So I have a local max of 4. Where does that occur? That occurs when x is 0. And then finally, I have a local min. What is the min? I have a local min of um, f of 3, right? And I could put this here, f of 3. If we put in 3, 3 times, that's 3 to the 5th, really, right? Minus 4 times 27, minus 36 times 9, and then plus 4. Ooh, that's a serious min. Negative 185 at x equals 3. All right, guys. So that is the first derivative test. That is finding intervals over which you're increasing and decreasing. If you go from decreasing to increasing, it's a min. If you go from increasing to decreasing, it's a max. If you went from increasing to increasing, you have no extrema there. I'll show you a quick example of, of a situation like that. If we look at the graph of this function, so let's, let's graph this in Desmos and see if um, indeed this is what we're going to get. I believe we will. I hope so. Um, four, let's say 3x, again I'm graphing the original function, 3x to the fourth minus 4x cubed, minus 4x cubed minus 36x squared, right, and then plus 4. I'm going to have to zoom out here, which is to be expected, I think that should be a minus 4x cubed, it's to be expected, so that if we zoom out a little bit, you can see... <laughs> that I have some minimums. Notice that this is what we would expect to have. We have a local minimum. It's of 60. And then, whoops, down here, if you notice, we're going to have a local. And then you can see, whoa, whoa, Sarah. There we go. Um, that negative 185 is all the way down here. But it's doing what we expected it to do. And the great, the cool thing about this is I didn't have to graph that function to be able to know these things, right? I could just be given the algebraic function, and then I can use calculus to actually find those maximum and minimum values without having to see that algebra. Does this function have um, an absolute max or min? Yeah, I mean, just by looking at, sometimes you can't tell that just from this, but what do I know? I know this function at some point, it decreases, then I have a minimum, comes back up and increases, and then it decreases and then it increases, right? So this isn't actually what the function looks like. It looks more like this. But even if I had drawn this, right, I can see that because I'm increasing here and I've been, and here I know my behavior is like this here and it's like this here, I know that I'm going to actually have an absolute minimum just by the behavior of what I've seen with my chart right here. All right, you guys, let's do another one. That was that was a good time. So let's do, let's use the first derivative test again. So this is part B to find the local extrema of the following function. You might as well do a little trigonometry because I know it makes you happy. How about x plus 2 sine of x? But I want to find the local extrema, let's say, just on a specific interval, um, just because we know that this guy goes on forever, right? <laughs> Not like me. It goes on forever. So what's the first step? Again, use the first derivative test. The first step is to take the first derivative. Find the critical points, right? So I get 1 plus 2 cosine x equals 0. So I'm going to solve this for 0 to find my critical values. So what does this imply? This implies that the cosine of x equals a negative 1 half. All right, you guys, let's do some tricks. So where is cosine negative? Cosine are your x values. So I know cosine is negative in quadrant 2 and in quadrant 3. And now, if I think about what angle when I take its cosine is 1 half, that would be 60 degrees or pi over 3. So I know I have a reference angle of pi over 3. So what is the angle here? This angle here would be 2 pi over 3. And then also in the second, or excuse me, third quadrant, right? This angle is pi over 3, 
So pi over 3 away from pi, so it looks like I have 4 pi over 3. So what are my critical values then? My critical points, right, are x equals 2 pi over 3 and 4 pi over 3. So I'm going to do the same thing. Even though I'm in radians and dealing with trig, I'm still going to do the same thing. I'm going to test. Now I know I have 0 here. Sometimes I'll put these just to remind myself not to go past there. I usually don't, but... I'll do 2 pi over 3 here and 4 pi over 3 here. And what am I testing? I'm testing the derivative, right, which is 1 plus 2 cosine x. This one I don't really break up because it's not multiplication, it's addition. So I actually need to keep these two together. All right, so 2 pi over 3 is here in the second quadrant. So I'm going to take a test value, and I'm going to let that test value be pi over 2. And the reason I'm going to do pi over 2 is because I know that the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So if I plug in pi over 2, I get 1 plus 0, which is 1, which means that it's positive, right? So what do I know about the function? It's increasing here, okay? What about 4 pi over 3? So 4 pi over 3 is here in the third quadrant. I'm going to grab the test point pi because I know that's one of the easiest ones to do. Cosine of pi is a negative 1, so I get 1 plus 2 times a negative 1. That would be 1 minus 2, which is a negative 1, which is negative. So what do I know about my derivative here? It's negative, so my function is decreasing. Finally, um, I'm going to 2 pi, right? So 4 pi over 3 to 2 pi. I could grab anything in here. Let's take 3 pi over 2. So 3 pi over 2. What do I know about the cosine of 3 pi over 2? The cosine of 3 pi over 2, right, is 0. So again, I get a positive right here. So what do I know about my function? It's increasing here because the derivative is positive. So just looking at this graph, right, I can see that what do I have at 2 pi over 3? I have a max. And what do we have at 4 pi over 3? We have a min. Okay, what are those maximum and minimum values? Well, what is f of 2 pi over 3? If I plug that into my function, I get 2 pi over 3 plus, well, sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. So I get, we have a local max of what? This value right here, 2 pi over 3 plus root 3, which we could, you know, I think I'm going to go ahead and find, um, I'm going to just put that in my calculator. I'm going to do 2 times pi divided by 3 plus the square root of 3. It makes a little bit more sense to me, um, especially when I'm talking about a maximum or a minimum value. Uh, sometimes to me, I think, oh, I keep messing up, I'm sorry. <laughs> Apparently, um, using a scientific calculator can sometimes be beyond me. All right, so what do we get? We get a local max of about 3.826. Whoops of 3.826, where does that occur? It occurs at x equals 2 pi over 3. And then I know I have a minimum. I have a local min um, of, it will be 4 pi over 3, so 4 times pi divided by 3. And then I'll actually be minus root 3 um, because I'm in the third quadrant. So I'm going to just put that into my calculator. You could put this all into your calculator at once. And so what do we get here? We have a local min of 2.457 um, at, where does that occur? X equals 4 pi over 3. Good. And then because they give you a closed interval, you know, you could put in, you could find absolute max and mins, but you could put in 0 into your function, you could put 2 pi into your function, and then you can see which numbers are the biggest. Again, the extreme value theorem still applies here. Now you could have an extreme value at either one of your local max or local mins. Remember, a local max can also be an absolute max, and an absolute max is still a local max. Um, so you could, you could have those extreme values on that. Whew. That's a lot. I think I'm going to, um, we still have to talk about the second derivative test. Um, I would actually like to do maybe one more example of the first derivative test, and then I think we'll, I'm going to stop this video and then create another video for the second part of that, of this section. So let's look at one more example of um, using the first derivative test to find extremists. So part C. 
Okay, so this is going to be kind of an interesting function. Let's look at f of x equals x times x minus 4 cubed. Now, you sure could expand that x minus 4 cubed out if you wanted to, but I don't recommend it. Let's, again, find our critical points. So f primed of x, and I'll give you some hints here on the algebra. I'm going to go ahead and do the um, product rule. Leave the first times the derivative of the second. So this is chain rule. But the nice thing is derivative of the outside, leave the inside. The derivative of the inside is 1. Then plus leave the second, x minus 4 cubed times the derivative of the first. So one way, don't FOIL this all out. We're going to set this equal to 0, right? So don't FOIL this all out. Notice what we have common. We have an x minus 4 squared, right, in each one of these. So I'm going to first factor out that x minus 4 squared. And what would I be left with? Well, here I'd be left with 3x. Here I'd be left with an x minus 4 to the first power. So I don't need the parentheses anymore around that. And so what do I end up getting? I get x minus 4 squared times 4x minus 4 equals 0. So here are my critical points. My critical points then, here this is going to be x equals 4 right? And then here if I set 4x minus 4 equal to 0, I get 4x equals 4, so x equals 1. So I have two critical points, okay? And I'm going to use, for the first derivative test, I'm going to see is my derivative positive or is it negative around these two critical points? So this is 1, this is 4. Um, I'm going to use this form of my derivative, okay? So let's see what happens to x minus 4 squared. Let's see what happens to 4x minus 4. And then when I multiply those two together, that gives me my actual derivative. Okay, so a number less than 1, pick 0. If you can ever pick 0, pick 0. If I put in 0, I get 0 minus 4 is a negative 4. If I square negative 4, I get positive 16, so that's positive. If I put in 0 here, right, I get 0 minus 4, that's negative. So what is my derivative going to be? It's going to be negative. So what do I know about this function from minus infinity to 1? It's decreasing because my derivative is negative. All right, number between 1 and 4, 3. If I put in 3, 3 minus 4 is a negative 1 squared is positive. Guys, this one's always going to be positive because of that squared. <laughs> um, if I put in 3 here, I get 12 minus 4, which is 8 or something. But all I care about is it's positive. So what do I know about my derivative here? It's positive. So I know I am increasing, right, from 1 to 4 because my derivative is positive. And then finally, let's put in 5. 5 minus 4 is 1. When I square it, it's positive. If I put in 5 there, I get a positive. So I get a positive here. So I wanted to do this one because you can't always, we know what assuming does, people. We know what assuming does. You can't always assume that you're going to get a, a, a local max or min at every critical value, okay? So clearly in this one, I, I can see that I have a local minimum, right? I have a local min of... What is my local min? Well, whatever f of 1 is, right, which I think if I put 1 back in here, negative 3 cubed is a negative 27 times 1. Negative 27, where does it occur? At x equals 1. And then no local extrema at 4. I don't have to state that, but maybe it's not a bad thing to do it. No extrema at 4. Remember, I have to change direction for me to have an extrema. Let's graph this function and kind of see what this looks like. Right here, this is saying I have a horizontal asymptote at 4, but I go from increasing to increasing, so this is probably going to look kind of like x cubed, which makes sense because I have a cube in my function, right? So like that kind of makes sense. All right, let's graph this. We're going to have to come back in here. <laughs> this is difficult to see because of my last one. Yeah, so look at this. This is a great function to see how the first derivative test tells us every not everything we need to know, but a lot of what we need to know. So notice I decrease, decrease, decrease until at x equals 1, right? I hit a negative 27. Then I increase, increase, increase. At 4, you can see this behaves like a cubic, right? At 4, this is one of our zeros. If you remember it all from college algebra, if you guys got through that, um, this is a zero of multiplicity three. And so it's going through like a cubic. So I go up increasing, increasing. I get my derivative to be zero, but then I continue increasing. So it's actually not a local max or a min at that point. All right, you guys, I've been talking straight for 50 minutes. 
so I'm a little bit tired. So I'm going to um, take a break and I'll post this one right now for you um, and then just watch for part two of 4.3.